complicated set of things that are going on here. I found that in most of our patients, and I've mentioned this to some of you here today, if anti-migraine medication regimens are pursued, sooner or later something is going to be found that will relieve the headache. The trouble with the migraine medications is it takes, you usually have to take them for three to six months before you realize that there's any effect from them, and then you have to, if that doesn't work, then you have to start again and try something else, and then drop that one and try something else. But sooner or later, something is going to be found in most patients. So, well, you know, I'm supposed to be talking about the surgical treatment that we use in children, and we've talked about why these operations are done. We're, we want to enhance that external carotid collateral to the brain in patients. And Gary talked about the direct operation. We use um, an indirect operation that we call the peel synangiosis. I'm going to describe that to you. But all of these indirect procedures, as Gary mentioned, you involve taking some sort of vascularized tissue and plastering it to the brain in some way so that new blood vessels are going to grow into the brain from that vascularized substance. Uh, the, so I'll describe this peel synangiosis technique to you. We do what Gary has talked to you about. We mark out the scalp vessel with a Doppler probe. That's a little ultrasound probe that he showed that you can mark out the course of the vessel. And in children, sometimes these are so tiny, you know, we have to make little marks over the, over the scalp to make sure we can find this vessel when we dissect it. We use a microscope to make an incision over it and to, then to separate from the tissues of the scalp. We try to do the biggest possible bone opening in the skull that we can, given the length of that incision, because the more surface area of the brain that we can expose to these tissues, the better will be the ingrowth of new blood vessels. So we try to make a large opening in the skull. The Japanese, when they described their initial procedure, by the way, they did this little thin sliver of an operation. And if that does not work as well, you have to do a large exposure. We open the dura, that's that coverings of the brain that Gary showed again. And we open the dura very extensively into little flaps because blood flow is going to grow into the brain from the cut edges of that dura. And the more surface area of that we expose to the brain, the better the results are going to be. And uh, I mentioned we open the arachnoid, that's that gossamer thin translucent membrane over the surface of the brain to make sure there's no final barrier between the blood vessels that we're presenting to the brain surface and the brain itself. And then we suture the artery directly to the brain to keep it plastered down onto the brain so that the blood vessels will grow into the brain. From like Gary mentioned that we, uh, Ed Smith and I did a, um, what do you call that, Ed, that we did on, that's on the webinar. web? Webinar. No, it's not a webinar, but it, is it? Maybe it is. From webcast. Chil yeah, webcast, something like that, where the operation, you can see a video of the operation if you're interested in it. It's on the Children's Hospital site. So uh, here's some pictures from surgery. Now, when we do our children, we try to do both sides of the brain at the same time. The idea here being that the anesthesia, most anesthesias are risky for patients with moya moya. Yep. That's because the, the kids tend to get, when the an anesthetist puts in the endotracheal tube, before they do that, they tend to hyperventilate the patient. That hyperventilation is not good. There are changes in blood pressure during the induction of anesthesia, and that's not good. So we try to get our operations done in one fell swoop if we can by getting both sides done at once if the patient has bilateral disease. So here's a child draped out for surgery. The child, this is the child's head here. This is the endotracheal tube that's supplying oxygen during the surgery. And here's the scalp marked with that uh, marker that shows us where the artery is. And this is on the left side of the head. When the operation is finished there, the patient will be flipped and we'll go ahead and do the right side. So again, for the squeamish, you can look away here. But this is the scalp artery here, right in between my large red circle here. It's a tiny little vessel in this baby. This is about 0.3 millimeters, and, and Gary's smiling. But these are too small to do uh, bypass operations on, I think. Uh, we separate that artery from the scalp. This is a, uh, a probe that uses electrocautery to sort of sear the tissues on either side of the artery to separate it from the tissues of the scalp. On the right side, we're sort of developing and spreading the skin so that we can do the operation. 
here's a picture of the of the operative field with the bone having been taken off and you can see these are the dural flaps here these guys right here that are held off on sutures those are the little pieces of dura that are off on the side we you see there's about six of these and then we will open this arachnoid the picture on the left shows a little delicate knife that's used to open the arachnoid uh, which is that last final barrier and then on the right you can see the opening of the arachnoid more extensively you can see the cut edges over here right along this area and some of the brain exposed it's interesting you know the brain here on the right you can see all these little blood vessels on the surface of the brain it's very engorged and, and you would think in a patient with moya moya those the brain would be pale and there wouldn't be much in the way of blood vessels but the blood vessels on the surface of the brain are the only ones that are really working correctly and they're dilated because they're not getting enough uh, oxygen and the normal reaction of those blood vessels in the brain in anybody's brain when they're not getting enough oxygen is to dilate so they're very expanded and hyperemic the brain looks really red in many of these children here's another picture with that arachnoid open now the suture material we use the same suture material for the synangiosis that Gary does for his direct surgeries this is the needle here that's being passed right through the outer layer of the brain. This is that 10 suture that Gary mentioned that's, uh, I guess, 33 microns. Now the diameter of a red cell is what, eight microns. So this is maybe two or three red cells in diameter. It's a very narrow suture. And then we're gonna bring this up and stitch it to the uh, brain, to the superficial temporal. Here's the final picture before the bones put back in. This is the super, superficial temporal artery. Here's these dural pieces that are let put back down on the surface of the brain, and we know blood vessels are going to grow from them as well. And then we're going to put the bone flat back on top of that and close the skin. So this surgical technique, we have uh, 330 patients who are 21 years old or younger that were operated on when the, we first started using this specific technique through uh, the end of last year. And as Gary mentioned, more females than males. Again, in everybody's series, this is the way it seems to be. But it's, um, it's, you can see the ratio here. This is very interesting to me. Most of our kids, we end up operating on them. Now, there are lots of exceptions. There are people at all ends of the spectrum. But most of the kids, it's around seven years, with their first symptom around six and a half years. Uh, it's an interesting developmental thing. And so many times, if I see a child presenting with symptoms and they're six, but we really rush them to get them done because we know how things are going to be evolving. As I say, there's a vast range. You saw that little girl who had her first stroke at eight months, and, and one of our children is only six months old at first surgery. So the clinical presentations, these are interesting. You know about the stroke and TIAs and headache that Gary talked about. We've got a couple of kids that presented first with seizures, presumably due to not enough blood getting to the brain. Incidental, and these are the ones that are important for uh, those of us who take care of children that have been treated for other conditions that may lead to the development of moya moya. Certain children with brain tumors, certain children who have had x-ray therapy to the brain, children with leukemia who have been treated with medicines that have been given in the spinal, uh, into the spinal fluid and that later can cause Moi, moi. So as neurosurgeons, we have to pay attention to this and look at these scans and follow our kids' scans carefully to, to find out when these symptoms are starting to evolve. Choreiform movements. Anybody know what chorea is? This is an involuntary movement of the arm or leg. It's C-H-O-R-E-A. And these are often caused by streptococcal infections, but you might remember, as Gary showed you, these little fine vessels going up through the basal ganglia at the center parts of the brain. This is a switchboard area where information from the motor parts of the brain courses down uh, to the rest of the body. And when there are problems in this basal ganglia, these choreiform movements can develop. And uh, it's interesting that a number of children that we've had have presented initially with these movements. And the hemorrhage cases that Gary and I have talked about that are not supposed to occur in children. We've had eight of these who have presented in kids with hemorrhage. 
Now, this is a, a slide when I've talked to neurosurgeons, I say, you, you might talk to them, I say, you've got to pay attention to this slide because this is the associated conditions that occur in a Moya Moya population. A large number of, of children of Asian uh, ancestry and extraction, you can see other conditions like Gary mentioned, uh, neurofibromatosis, Down syndrome. It's interesting to me uh, the number of children now that we're seeing with Down syndrome, and I think it's because these children who had developed symptoms before, often the doctors taking care of them said, well, uh, this is Down syndrome, they have heart problems, and you know, nothing we can do about this. Now that the MRI is around, and these kids are getting MRIs, this diagnosis is being made more and more frequently, and the number of children with Down syndrome is rapidly moving up in our own patient population. Uh, I'll mention some of these others in a minute, but we talked earlier about kidney problems uh, and kidney uh, infarcts. We have six children in our patient population that have had associated narrowing of the arteries that go to the kidney. Nobody knows why that happens or why that is, but it's a phenomenon that's been observed. Uh, and uh, Ed Smith, who's going to be talking next, is an expert in this part of the, the uh, spectrum here, the kids that have other blood vessel, uh, blood forming uh, disorders like sickle cell disease and other anemias. Uh, can present with Moya and Moya. We're seeing many more of those now that these children are being worked up much more carefully. This is a, apropos of that height question earlier. This is uh, she, well, and you can see her picture here on the left. She um, had this large vascular anomaly on her face. And at, at Children's Hospital, we've got this big vascular anomalies group, and they see kids from all over the world that have these very complex disorders of blood vessels in the rest of their body that need to be 